Hey folks, Joshua here, uh, Sanity's Cove YouTube channel. I was maybe rather foolishly jumping into the wilds of social media, looked on Facebook, and uh, one of the friends I follow posted um, a comment uh, about um, what's going to happen when he dies. He's a Christian, and it received a few comments underneath, and one of those comments really kind of leapt out at me. Uh, not because it was a bad comment, it was actually a very... Uh, um, it was one of those comments that articulates how I think a lot of people think and, and feel. And it just sprung on me that I, I want to make a short response video to this because chances are either you think like this or somebody you know and love and, and care about uh, thinks like this. And so I'm reading it not because, I mean, I, obviously there's some disagreement, but not because I think it's a bad comment, um, but it, it in a clear way um, reflects how a, a, a lot of people think. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to read his comment. It's about uh, hell and um, and what what happens to non-believers when they die. I assume this guy is not a believer. I assume he's not a Christian based on what he wrote. I'm not trying to be judgmental. I'm just, I, it, it just comes across that way. Um, but but uh, in his uh, in his comments um, about why he's not a Christian or why he at least rejects the Christian notion of hell, uh, I I think there's some misunderstandings, and I think a lot of people have an issue uh, nowadays in our country have an issue about hell uh, based on maybe a misunderstanding of what it is that Christians have historically believed. Now I got to say we as Christians have not done ourselves very many favors. I think many times when Christians kind of superficially on social media or different places um, express belief in afterlife of heaven and hell, they do so in a, in a very sloppy manner. So I think if there's a misunderstanding out there, then uh, we're really the culprits. We have not reflected well uh, on these things. So um, if, if you're one of those people, Christian or non-Christian, who struggles with this issue, uh, I, I hope that just in going through his comment and responded to it, um, we can bring a little clarity. First of all, he, he, this is his first sentence. I, uh, I'm not going to mention his name because I'm not trying to create like a social media pile on. I have no idea who this guy is. He, he could be a great guy. He could be a great uh, husband, father, worker, wh whatever. I'm, so don't look him up and tag him and social media pile on him. Um, he says, I refuse to believe that if Jesus is real and the Bible is accurate, that non-believers are abandoned by him at death and sent to hell. Okay, powerful uh, first sentence there. I, I, my response is, that's, as, as a Christian, as someone who once wasn't a Christian and now has, I, I've come to the Christian faith, um, that's not how I, I would see the subject. I would just see that through a very different lens. Um, m the way I understand the, the Christian story is that human beings have chosen to walk uh, away from God. Uh, we have uh, abandoned God. God hasn't abandoned us. We've abandoned him. Uh, scripture says, like all of us, like sheep have gone astray. Each of us have gone our own way. He created us. He made us good. But we've wandered into uh, sin and selfishness and foolishness and, um, you know, just done things we shouldn't. We've sort of given God the finger and say, hey, we want to live our lives just fine without you. And so we are the ones who has kind of broken that relationship. And so we live this life uh, apart from God. Um and if we die in that state, we continue to exist into um, all eternity apart from God. As we've lived in this life, uh, then we will continue to uh, live um, on in, into the life to come. Uh, so Christ is not abandoning us. The, the abandonment is, uh, that's what we have done. And it's not that he abandons us at the point of death. We abandoned him a long time ago. Uh, we abandoned him in life and said we would rather uh, not have got Christ. We don't want you as part of our life. God, creator, uh, you may have made me. You have fashioned me. You got my heart beating. You put air in my lungs. Uh, but I don't want you to be part of my life. Um, and God, for whatever reason, he allows the creatures that he creates, he allows them to go off and exist uh, at least semi uh, apart from him. Uh, you know, I still think he puts air in their lungs and keeps their heart beating to some degree, but um, in life they, they live apart from him and then you step into eternity and I think that distance between God and creature is just amplified then at the time of death. It's like, you know, in this life we get a foretaste of what it's like to live apart from God and we're angry and frustrated and bitter and uh, we, we don't have the love of God flowing through our lives because we're apart from him. And then I think in eternity we continue on that trajectory. So we're on a trajectory in life and in eternity we just continue on in that trajectory and our hearts get harder and we get more loveless. Um, 
but it's not a question of Christ abandoning us. Like he walked with us all the way through life and then suddenly he's like, yeah, <laughs> I've changed my mind. See you later. So I wouldn't see it that way. Secondly, he says, if the story is true, then he understands human nature, I, which I agree with. I think he does. This, this is what Christians believe by the incarnation, that God is not a distant God, but he actually took on human nature. That's what Christmas is all about, that God was born as a fragile, frail human being that could get cold, that could get tired, that uh, could get sleepy, that could be hurt, that could bleed. Um, you know, this is the Christian message that uh, the God that we worship understands human nature in a way that no other God can claim to do. So if the story is true that he understands human nature and would forgive um, our lack of understanding or belief in him. Yeah, God is definitely yeah, quick and e easy to forgive. I don't know if you've ever had a relationship. Maybe the relationship has fallen apart. You want to be reconciled, but unless the person comes back and says, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I kind of blew it, sorry for the way I treated you, it, you offering forgiveness is not enough to um, make the reconciliation really happen. I mean, you, you can in your heart say, man, I'd, I'd, be, I'd be so willing to forgive them um, if, they, if they would just come back to me and say, hey, sorry for the way I hurt you. And yes, I would forgive them and, and welcome them back. We, we see that in the story of the prodigal son in Luke 15. The prodigal spurns his father, cusses out his father, leaves, spends the family inheritance, and then he comes back, father, I'm, I'm so sorry. And the father hugs him, embraces him. Um, so God understands our nature, absolutely. And he wants to offer forgiveness. He invites us back. It's, it's nothing about him not um, uh, understanding our nature or being unforgiving towards us. He would make his existence known through more channels than just an overly interpreted book. But, well, first of all, Christians don't believe that God's existence is known only through the Bible. Um, we don't believe any miracle is needed to um, to show that there's a creator. You don't need a supernatural work to show that he's a creator. Just his natural works uh, are, are more than enough. The, um, the symmetry and nature, the fine tuning of the universe, the sunrises, the sunsets, uh, the complexity, the beauty of the music of Bach, the delightful taste of a, of a well-aged bourbon whiskey, the curve of a woman's neck, the, I mean, the colors of the rain, all, you know, all, all, all these things. The world is filled with such symmetry, intelligence, and beauty that um, creation itself should point uh, to a, a, a creator. So we don't, Christians generally don't believe the Bible's the only evidence uh, for God's existence. In fact, the Bible doesn't even teach that the Bible's the only uh, evidence for God's existence. Men and women, the fact that we're here on the space rock flying around at 25,000 miles an hour is uh, evidence that th there's some intelligent uh, mind out there. He would make his existence known through more channels than just an overly interpreted book that's been heavily modified uh, and influenced by corrupt earthly rulers and kings whose main goal is to subdue and control the masses uh, for fear of eternal damnation. Uh, so, so um, you know, th this guy, fella, I, you know, I don't know you. Um, you're definitely very passionate about this uh, in, in the way you word this. Uh, but I would take issue. I, I think the Bible's actually been more of a revolutionary book than a control book. Um, there's a reason that the Bible is outlawed in China. There, there's a reason that the Bible's outlawed in the kingdom of Saudi Arabia. There's the reason that you're put in jail, you and your whole family, in, in North Korea, uh, if you own um, a Bible. The Bible is a reason many, um, you know, the Roman em emperors burned Bibles if they could find any, any copies of the scriptures. Um, it's because the governments, the, the message of the Bible is that there is a king and an authority over earthly governments. See, so get rid of God, the, the highest power is the state. Um, that's why the most, some of the most tyrannical governments on earth are, are, are very atheistic in their belief. Um, but if you hold to a book that says kings of the earth, do justice, love mercy, care for the poor, because one day you're going to have to give an account to God above. I mean, it kind of puts rulers and governments in their rightful place when you say Christ is king of kings and, and lord of lords. Um, and so I think you could make just as strong a case that the Bible is a revolutionary book as a book for tyrants. At the very least, I think that comment uh, is one-sided. I'm not saying it's a revolutionary in the book in the sense that you read it and you join Antifa or Black Lives Matter protests and just try to burn everything down to the ground. Um, but I'm saying it, it, it's definitely a, a book that our founders, the founding fathers of America, 
used in their appeals when they created limited government. Um, they cited the Bible a lot because they knew that corrupt human nature could become very tyrannical unless there's a system of checks and balances. Uh, so I, I, I would like at the very least to see that unpacked a little more. His comment goes on, you will never convince me that literally billions of people were simply biblically unaware and were sentenced to hell simply because they were not followers of Jesus. Well, yeah, again, again I, I agree. And, and Christians, just we don't think that. Uh, we believe that all our creeds, from the uh, Apostles' Creed to the Nicene Creed in 325, it, it all says that you know he will come back to judge the living and the dead, and that his uh, his justice will be fair. Now, how he judges the world and how he judges each and every single human being, you know, th that's going to be interesting. Uh, how he does it, but no one on that last day is going to think, "Oh, Jesus, you weren't fair. You know, you were too lenient on that guy, or you were you were too harsh on that guy." Uh, we have chosen. Um, separation from God, and we have each gone on our own path. And now our sins have been different. That doesn't mean we're all equally guilty. Uh, not everyone in hell is the same. Not everyone in heaven is the same. But when we stand before God and he says, this is what you've done, you need to live with the consequences of this now. I, I think one of the best books uh, that does this is Charles Dickens' book, um, you know, um, his, his short book, uh, The Christmas One, um, you know, A Christmas Carol, where, you know, you have Jacob Marley, uh, figure at the beginning of the book when, when Scrooge goes upstairs and uh, Marley comes and, and Marley is wearing all these chains and Scrooge looks at Marley and says, uh, you know, this is Marley's ghost and says, Marley, uh, you know, he's scared to see this ghost. Well, what are all these chains that you're wearing? And he says, these are the chains I forged in life, Ebenezer Scrooge, and you know, I have to carry with me now for eternity. And your chain was this big seven years ago and you've been adding to it, you know, ever since. Um, that's a more accurate, uh, actually, depiction of what traditional historic Christianity teaches about hell than I think, um, I, I think maybe a lot of po popular stereotypes uh, flying around um, uh, nowadays. So I would love to meet this guy sometime, sit down, uh, have a drink, and um, hear more of what he has to say, and more importantly, why he has to say it. He, he seems to be, uh, word these things quite strongly, and um, no, maybe either he's been uh, maybe hurt and disappointed by a Christian, or maybe life's just hard, or maybe he's just been having a bad day. Uh, but God bless him. I'm not going to mention his name, but uh, God bless you, sir. Um, and thank you, though, I think, for articulating what a lot of people think. I think there's a lot of misunderstanding on this topic, and uh, may God give clarity to this. All right, uh, have an excellent day, and um, hopefully you have more videos coming out soon. Bye.